Right to Information Act was one of the most uh, uh, progressive legislation that the uh, UPA government brought and it for the first time gave the citizen the power to question the authorities uh, because in this country even though we had become democracy, uh, the bureaucrats and even the people's representatives did not feel accountable to the people. They somehow thought that they were above the people. I mean their whole lifestyle and you know uh, the way they interact with people reflects that. They try to maintain a distance from the people and whatever decisions they were taking and the money that they were spending was uh, uh, you know not known to people. So RTI provided for the first time in this country an opportunity to the people to access the information as well as you know uh, how the decisions are taken and what decisions are being taken. Uh, information about these important things. So uh, it brought in a, a regime of transparency and accountability which is very necessary for democracy. A democracy uh, has no meaning if you don't have transparency and accountability. It is so basic and initially there was a lot of enthusiasm about it among the people. The information commissioners who were appointed were, were also helping the applicants get the information. But slowly as is the wont, the bureaucracy you know figured out ways of stonewalling the questions and it, they figured out ways of trying to avoid giving information. And today the situation has come to that, uh, that the information commissioners are totally taking the side of the public information officers, not providing information to the applicants, disposing of cases even when the applicant is not satisfied and they are clearly protecting the establishment. So it is very unfortunate that this has happened. Some of the RTI activists uh, have been shot dead outside the, uh, the information commissions and some of them have been humiliated by the commissioners inside the, uh, the you know, uh, their offices. So, uh, it is not good news for the RTI activists. Oh, NDA government is very anti-people government. They do not care about people at all. They uh, are helping the capitalists, they are their rich friends who give them donations to contest elections and they worry about their agenda. The agenda of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh of building temple in Ayodhya and things like that. They are not at all worried about the common people's problems. See, UP election was uh, fought by the BJP with uh, Kesho Prasad Maurya who hails from the OBC community as their president. And in addition to their traditional upper caste vote, this time they were able to mobilize the non Yado OBC and the non Chamar SC votes by uh, inducting important leaders from these communities in the party or having alliances with them. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, Kaushal Kishore, who was with CPI earlier, then formed his own party, uh, you know, contested election on behalf of BJP. Uh, he is an important Dalit leader in central UP, in the Awadh area. Uh, they had alliance with Apna Dal, which is a party of uh, the OBC Patel community. Um, then they had an alliance with Om Prakash Rajbhar, who is an important leader of the OBC Rajbhar community. So, uh, taking into fold all these important leaders, they were able to win the elections. Otherwise, they would not have been able to win the elections because the upper caste vote uh, bank, which is their core, core vote bank, is not enough. But they made an upper caste person and that too, um, a religious uh, head of uh, the institution in Gorakhpur as the chief minister. People were shocked, although some sections of BJP uh, were enthusiastic because they saw in Yogi Adityanath the next prime minister of India. Uh, but what he has done uh, since he became the chief minister is a big letdown because he uh, adopted a policy of uh, going for the criminals. Uh, there were uh, close to 50 or more than 50 encountered deaths. Uh, we don't know whether all of them were actually criminals because their cases were pending in the court 
and it has happened in this country when you know uh, accused have been acquitted because of lack of evidence and mr yogi adityanath himself had several cases against him including uh, a case of murder of a policeman so he uh, withdrew all the cases against him and targeted the other criminals so this was a policy which was obviously you know uh, uh, very skewed uh, he uh, he was taking only a one sided view of the criminals so everybody outside his party and that that and, and that included you know people mostly from obc dalit and and muslim community they were seen as criminals whereas you know the upper caste people now have a free run whether you uh, talk about the bjp mp uh, uh, lakhanpal sharma who attacked the office of ssp in uh, in saharanpur when the uh, bjp youth were not allowed to take out a rally uh, on the occasion of maharana pratap's anniversary through a dalit um, community um, or you consider the case of the death of the inspector recently uh, so the upper caste people and there have been you know uh, mob lynchings and those kind of things in which the youth associated with the hindutva organizations who are mostly upper caste are involved so they have a free run to commit any crime that they want to and the administration and the police is on their side no action is taken against them and uh, uh, you know they are targeting everybody else so the law and order situation in uttar pradesh has become very bad and i think uh, uh, people are being shot you know uh, openly in, in lucknow there was you know um, a shootout in hajrat ganj which is the main crossing and so people are dying policemen are dying and the government is not doing anything about it and i think uh, uh, the bjp will have to pay a price for this kind of situation on the other hand they are again raising the issue of ayodhya it is well known that bjp exploits people's religious sentiments for political purposes but what is shocking is that when professor gd agrawal of iit kanpur who had become a sadhu in 2011 uh, and he was known as swami gyan swarup sanand he sat on a fast from 22nd june in haridwar and he was on fast for 112 days he wrote four letters to the prime minister two before starting his fast and two during his fast but the prime minister did not pay any attention to it to to these letters and ultimately he died uh, after fasting for 112 days before that uh, another sadhu swami sigmanand has nigmanand has died in 2011 fasting against illegal uh, mining in ganga sand mining he also died in a hospital like uh, professor gd agrawal and the matra sadan the ashram with which these two seers were associated has accused the government the then bjp government of having murdered him in the hospital by injecting poison into his body uh, a third sadhu is is sitting on fast right now sant gopal das has disappeared from all india institute of medical sciences in delhi uh, from 4th of december and a young sadhu from kerala uh, brahmachari atmabodhanan is sitting on fast for over 60 days at matra sadan in haridwar and it is surprising that the government is not paying any attention to these sadhus who are continuously fasting and dying and disappearing so uh, if bjp is really concerned about the hindu religion ganga is one of the important symbols of hindu religion and mr modi himself said when he went to contest the election from varanasi that he has been called by mother ganga he changed the name of water resources ministry to include ganga rejuvenation in it but uh, he is not paying to this issue whereas 41% of india's population lives next to ganga or its tributaries so if the demand of these sadhus is met that is uh ganga is allowed to free uh, flow freely 
and and uh, uninterrupted in an uninterrupted manner and is cleaned 41% of the population is going to benefit but instead of choosing to uh, make ganga clean they are again raking up the issue of ram temple in ayodhya which i don't know who it is going to benefit and uh, you know in kerala they have taken even a more regressive step by not allowing uh, women of child bearing age to enter the sabrimala temple they are supporting the movement which is opposing the entry of women in temple and uh, it is a hypocrisy that they are talking about the rights of muslim women the triple talaq bill was passed in lok sabha yesterday uh, mr modi who himself has left his wife Uh, who was a primary school teacher in Gujarat i met her earlier this year in june during my Indi- india pakistan peace and friendship padyatra where she came to support the the cause she has been denied passport she wanted to go to the united states her nephew brother's son has been expelled from job from reliance company in rajasthan I mean, he is tormenting his own wife and he is saying that he is sensitive about muslim women who will believe that i mean you are targeting muslim women by bringing this bill of course triple talaq should be banned but not in the way uh, it is being done now the muslim community has to take a decision on that because it concerns them it is a personal law and uh, the uh, you know it is uh, shocking that you know they are not standing for the right of hindu women in kerala so this entire politics is a hoax it is an opportunistic politics to uh, gain to mobilize the hindu votes in their favor and to target the muslim community to force them into submission to live in this country like second rate citizens this kind of politics is not going to be supported by people for very long the election results in madhya pradesh chatisgarh rajasthan have already shown it and we hope that you know people will comprehensively reject this politics in 2019 i think just like the triple talaq issue uh, the cow slaughter issue is also meant to target the muslim community and to force them into submission to accept the hindu hegemony uh, cow slaughter there is a law against cow slaughter if you are guilty of cow slaughter you can go to jail in uttar pradesh for 2 years uh and i and and there are laws in other other parts of the country also so uh even if somebody is genuinely accused of cow slaughter i mean how can some youth associated with hindutva organizations take law into their own hands and and mob lynch people to death i mean you have to file a complaint with the police the police can take an action the magistrate or the judge can can award a sentence but how can the people take law into their own hand but this has been the 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 working style of the hindutva organizations they killed gandhi they demolished Bab- babri masjid which i think is the mother of all terrorist incidents in india because the first serial bomb blast which were later called the terrorist incidents happened after the babri masjid demolition in mumbai in the early 1993 so they have a history of taking law into their own hand and this mob lynching thing is part of that it is uh, amazing that some of the uh, and mr modi has himself said that some of his jain friends own the biggest slaughter houses in india uh, so the uh, the the cows are mostly you know kept by the hindu families who sell them after they become old or when the tractors are you know uh, ha- have been adopted by farmers for farming uh, the the uh, bull has no use now so the the bull calf is sold the male calf is sold uh, and you know uh, they are either kept in the gaushalas which are not very many so they ultimately you know land up in in slaughter houses so if the government is so worried about protecting cows now they will have to create a gaushala in every village because the uh, village heads in uttar pradesh from sitapur district have told me that it is now a problem in every village that these herds of old cows and young male calves 
are roaming around and eating the crops of the people, destroying the crops of the people. And you can't do anything to them because people are afraid of selling them and people are afraid of buying them. So, uh, it is not just the uh, Muslim you know, traders or the owners of the uh, slaughterhouses who are affected, but it is uh, the common farmer who uh, keeps the cow, uh, you know, until the cow has a use, can give milk or the, the bull can be used for, for plowing the field. But as soon as they become useless, uh, he doesn't want to keep them. So the fault lies not just with the Muslim community, it lies with the Hindus also who don't want to keep the cows after they are not of any use to them. Uh, you can see cows roaming around in cities eating plastics when they die. You can open their stomach and, and you can get you know a lot of plastic from inside. So if these people are so worried about cows, they have to take care of them properly. But that is not their intention. They are using cows just for their politics, to mobilize their votes. Uh, there are so many Hindus who, who are non-vegetarians. And there might be some who might also be eating beef. So uh, the question that, you know, uh, if, from uh, animal rights perspective is, how is killing of cow bad, but killing of other animals is okay? I mean, if you are supporting the, the ban on cow slaughter, you have to support the ban of killing or, of every, every animal. So this is not from the animal rights perspective, this is purely from an opportunistic politics point of view that you know they are uh, supporting this uh, anti-cow slaughter movement and trying to polarize their votes, targeting the Muslim community. Muslim community is the only one who is being targeted, whereas number of eat, uh, meat eaters belong to the Hindu family. I mean you can find out, at least in my city Lucknow, during the Hindu festivals like, like Navratra, the uh, Muslims have to close their, their meat shops because most of their clients are Hindus who don't eat meat in those nine days. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, in our society, uh, you know, uh, there are a number of people who eat meat but only Muslims are being talk targeted. This is unfair and this is also, uh, you know, uh, doing the damage of, of uh, creating communal sentiments in the society, which will be very bad. Even if the BJP loses in 2019, it will be very bad to rectify the situation in society. Our society, um, you know, is largely uh, a heterogeneous society. It uh, follows a syncretic culture. I mean, the values that we were brought up with, I mean, our parents, <coughs> told us to believe in all the nice values like honesty and you know, uh, uh, you know, being friendly with people and uh, speaking truth and all that. But we were also told that you know, uh, if somebody else believes in some different ideology, then you have to basically respect them. But what the BJP or the Hindutva organizations have done in this country is they have claimed that their ideology is supreme and they think that everybody else is inferior to them. Uh, although they, very interestingly, they are converting the Hindu religion, which is a very tolerant religion, by copying, you know, other religions which are more aggressive and trying to make it like them. You know? uh, so, the strength of Hindu religion has been its tolerance. So many people have come from outside, invaders and people believing in different ideologies. But largely this country still remains a Hindu country uh, in terms of the percentage of population. So, uh, we should think about it. I mean, there are countries like Philippines where the entire country has become Christian because there were Christian invaders who came from outside. But that did not happen in India. So, there is something in Hindu religion because of which it has survived. And I think it is the value of tolerance, that is its strength. And in any way in Hindu religion, you can have the entire spectrum from an atheist to a person, you know, uh, believing in God or you could also believe in many gods or you could not believe in any God which has a physical form. 
but you know uh, is abstract uh but what they have done is by making hindu religion very aggressive which is clear from the uh, the posture of ram which is presented to people these days as 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 a, as a child i have never seen that picture of ram i mean the only picture of ram we saw was the picture of ram darbar where ram is there with sita and lakshman and hanuman and this posture of, and there were no lone pictures or statues of ram only when mr lal krishna advani started his rath yatra you see this aggressive posture of ram with with the, his arrow mounted on the bow ready to shoot his hair is flying back you know is a great warrior uh so uh, by projecting an aggressive ram these forces you know have used aggression on babri masjid on muslims on christians and they are trying to communally polarize this country gujarat is already very polarized i mean in gujarat the situation is that now uh, hindus and muslims are totally segregated you will not find a hindu in a muslim locality and you will not find a muslim in a hindu locality uh, or 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 the other way around uh, but in other parts of the country the situation may not be so bad in for example in lucknow where i live we still have muslim houses you know among the hindu rows of hindu houses so uh, people are able to live peacefully but somewhere uh, you know people have started talking about religion and especially in terms of of how it differentiates them from the other and they have they have uh, started noticing especially the the bad qualities of the people from the other religion this was not there earlier um uh, we have people like murari bapu who is is uh, you know trying to spread the message of communal harmony from his village temple in mahua in bhavnagar district in gujarat he has removed the weapons of ram lakshman and hanuman saying that uh, the future concept of god will be such that the god will not require any weapons he organizes a two day uh, sadbhavana parv in his ashram in mahua where uh, the theme of communal harmony is talked about and he listens to speakers who come from outside especially activists this year he honored fazal khan from delhi who has revived khudai khidmatgar the organization of khan abdul Uh, Gafar Khan uh, from Northwest Frontier Province in Pakistan, and a great freedom fighter, uh, colleague of Mahatma Gandhi, also known as Frontier Gandhi, uh, and uh, Dr. Mehrun Nisa Desai uh, from Ahmedabad, who is working in the field of higher education. So he has clearly sent out a message, strengthening the idea of communal harmony. He recently invited 200 sex workers from Mumbai. to uh, listen to his ram katha in ayodhya for which he was criticized that he is making ayodhya uh, polluted by by bringing these sex workers but in hindu religion any sinner can go and take a bath in ganga and and purify himself or herself i mean there is no restriction on on how much sin you have committed to be able to take a bath in ganga so uh, he is presenting the tolerant uh, view of hinduism he is saying that everybody is acceptable in 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 uh, his fold and uh, even sex workers who are normally you know uh, kept on the margins of society but you know these hindutva forces are even targeting him so uh, i think it is up to the hindu society now to choose what kind of uh, you know character they would like their religion to possess the character of communal harmony which has been there uh, you know since ages and that is how they have lived in harmony with others who have come from outside or have converted to other religions in this country uh, and this country has normally has a peaceful history of coexistence except for you know uh, some occasions when the communal frenzy takes over uh, but even after after participating in riots people realize that you know uh, what they did was not good for example in my india pakistan peace yatra in 2005 i met number of people in punjab who told that their fathers or grandfathers were involved in communal violence uh 
uh, killing the Muslims in the villages and throwing their dead bodies in the wells. But they said that what they did was not good. They should not have done that. So uh, that culture has to be strengthened. And the damage that the Hindutva organizations are doing to this society has somehow to be uh, stopped. It has to be answered back. There has to be an alternative uh, movement, you know, to counter this movement of projecting an aggressive Hindutva and communalizing the society. Because uh, uh, it will become very difficult for people to live in society if this kind of ideology is allowed to prevail. But hopefully people are rejecting that ideology and ultimately uh, communal harmony, syncretic culture, uh, living together, you know, uh, those values will ultimately prevail. So, uh, when I say Hindu religion is tolerant, I am essentially uh, saying it because in this country I see that, uh, you know, uh, different ideologies exist, coexist. Uh, you um, have a possibility of a Dalit woman becoming the chief minister of the most populous state of this country. I mean, where else in, in the world you see a person from the uh, lowest strata of the society and that to a woman uh, by votes, you know, becoming the executive head of a government. Um, and, and for some time she was also supported by the upper caste people, although it was for their own opportunistic, you know, reasons. But, uh, you know, it, it is a caste uh, ridden society, uh, there is no doubt about it. And caste system is, uh, is uh, very harmful uh, to the entire society, not just to the people who are the victims of it. Um, and uh, we, I think, have to take the view that Gandhi took, uh, who is accused of being a supporter of caste system, but actually over his life, he evolved as a human being. So from supporting the caste system, to rejecting it when he came in touch with Dr. Ambedkar. That is when he really understood, you know, uh, the implications of the caste system for the Dalits and, and people at the lower rungs of the hierarchy. And he changed his position to say that he would attend only those marriages which were intercaste because he saw that, you know, intercaste marriages were a solution to, to the caste system. And in the fag end of his life, he took a position that he will attend only those marriages which were intercaste and in which at least one of the parties was Dalit. So, uh, he uh, and of course, he, he ran a campaign for the entry of Dalits into the temples. So, he realized that caste system is bad and he wanted to fight against it. He did whatever he could. Dr. Ram Manohar Loya has also said that Intercaste marriages are the way to, to break this caste system. Kashi Ram has said that, you know, it may not be possible to do away with the caste system very easily because people have tried various methods, giving up their surnames, uh, breaking their, you know, janeu, the sacred thread and all these things, but it is not going away. So he said, if this is the Hindu caste system, which means a vertical hierarchy, then at least try to make it like this. So, you can have castes, but there should be coexistence, you know, of various castes, just like there is coexistence of various religions in this country. So, uh, I don't know what historical shape it will take, you know, in future, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, the only reason we, we, we say that, you know, this country is more tolerant is when we compare ourselves with other countries in the world, there are countries where, you know, only one religion is dominant. I mean, they have no idea that, you know, there can be other ideologies. When I go to the Muslim world and tell that I am a non-believer, they are shocked. Then so, Hindu religion is not a, a, not a monolithic religion. I mean, you don't have to believe in one God or one book to be called a Hindu. Uh, various scholars have defined it in various ways. I was looking at the dictionary of uh, Hinduism by uh, Professor Raj Bali Pandey of uh, Banaras Hindu University, who later became um, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Jabalpur University. He uh, was an Indologist, also incidentally related to me. He has described Hindus as people 
living across the Sindhu, looking from the western point of view, uh, I mean west of Sindhu, uh, all castes except for non-Muslims, you know, the amalgamation of all castes uh, except for Muslims uh, has been described as Hindus. So, so he is not saying they are one people. He is saying collection of all these various castes. So, it looks as if the caste identity is more important for Hindu religion than, than the religion itself and, and that may also be the reason why it is so difficult to do away with the caste system. And these various collectives of castes sometimes have lived together because they need each other's help. For example, if you look at the way the village is organized, uh, because various castes are identified with different works and everybody needs everybody else, therefore they are living together. Although practicing discrimination, uh, uh, you know, between them. Uh, and other times they have been fighting, uh, because they are part of different forces, of, of the armies of different kings who are fighting against the, each other. So, uh, this is how, you know, this country has existed. Uh, but largely, uh, whether it is because of the inherent character of the, the castes which come in the fold of Hindu religion or the people who have come from outside or the Bhakti tradition or the Sufis, the, the Sufi saints, uh, but a culture of, of uh, harmony has survived in this country. Largely, I see common people <coughs> who, who believe in any religion they believe in the idea that, that people believing in different ideologies can coexist and they try to live together. They participate in each other's religious festivals, which used to happen more in the past. Uh, but even now, some people make, make it a point to, you know, uh, jointly organize religious festivals and, uh, and such activities. So, uh, this kind of culture is, is what I was talking about as, you know, a tolerant culture, which is unfortunately now disappearing because of this politics of Hindutva and uh, this frenzy had also overtaken the country during the partition of this country and uh, uh, more than 10 lakh people died belonging to Hindu, Muslim and Sikh communities. But even after that, we have not learned a lesson. This is very sad. Again, people have supported this kind of uh, ideology which is very inimical. Uh, we only hope that, you know, uh, ultimately uh, good sense will prevail and the, the, uh, the practice of living together, believing in different ideologies will be again strengthened by the people. The issue with the farmers, uh, you know, which is being raised by farmers all over the country, uh, the two important issues are one is uh, waiving of loan and second is uh, getting uh, minimum support price. Unfortunately, uh, the land reforms is, is uh, people have realized is not on top of agenda now. Most of the governments are uh, backtracking from their commitment to land reforms. Uh, but uh, it is very crucial to solve the agrarian crisis. It is true that uh, the farmers, um, you know, who own land have to ultimately get the farming done by landless agricultural laborers. And if these agricultural laborers were not there, you will not see all this production. So, land to the tiller philosophy has to be implemented. Um, and, and the land reforms should be undertaken. There is also this question of uh, women farmers. Women, um, do more work on the agricultural fields, but the land title is not in their name. Even though there is a law now that the father has to divide his land among all his children, including girl, ch girl children, but usually the sisters will give up their rights in favor of their brothers under the pressure of a patriarchal system. And uh, the system continues as it was. So, uh, the administrators of this country and the policy makers have to ensure that the land is also in the name of women and the people who are working on agricultural fields as laborers become landowners. 
um, there is so much land is still there in this country uh, which which can be easily distributed you know among the people i mean there is lot of land with the government in addition to the land which is with the, the gram sabhas which is often encroached by vested interests you have so much land with the army with the railways with the you look at the uh, you know houses of the district magistrates i mean recently i visited the dm in jhansi in uttar pradesh i mean he has a palatial place i mean you know in terms of the area of the land so uh, i mean what is the need for these officials and these government departments to keep such big pieces of land all these land should be redistributed among the people <clears throat> and uh, the loans of course have to be waived but the problem is that what do you do with the informal system of of a loan in this country which the farmers uh, or the laborers uh, you know take from the money lenders and then they are trapped you know sometimes for generations they are not able to repay the high interest rates and also uh, uh, you know sometimes it is only uh, one type of banks either the national banks or the the cooperative banks which come under the state governments they waive the loans not all the banks are willing to waive the loans and uh, the method in which it is calculated sometimes it is ridiculous in in uttar pradesh uh, some farmers have got uh, uh, you know loan waivers of you know 30 rupees or 100 rupees or or you know some ridiculously low amounts like that so the government must uh, show a political will to uh, you know uh, resolve the agrarian crisis and to uplift the farmer from this crisis because it is in my view one of the two uh, biggest problems that our uh, country faces the other being the malnourishment of children so uh, demonetization was implemented uh, i along with an is officer friend of mine in uttar pradesh amod kumar wrote an article in times of india that rupees 500 and 1000 should be done away with but that was from the point of view that you know the corruption will be reduced if you have to pay big money in corruption then it will be difficult to carry that big amount in a smaller notes but this is not how we had we had perceived it i mean if you are banning a certain denomination note you have to give enough notice to the people and if if the same thing was done with with let's say a 6 months notice it would not have been so harsh on people but the whole idea of demonetization was defeated because uh, mr narendra modi brought back the the big denomination notes in fact a bigger denomination note of rupees 2000 so the corruption continues as it was earlier in fact now it has increased if you find out from any government department because there is an additional uh, worker of rss who is the ofi- official on special duty with every minister in uttar pradesh who is taking his 7% commission uh, so the the whole objective of trying to end corruption was defeated and it it caused a uh, lot of inconvenience to the common people i mean the only people we saw standing in queues to get their notes exchanged were either the poor or the middle class the people who possessed black money the rich people were nowhere to be seen so so what really happened to all the black money it is a reality that black money exists in society otherwise how could you fight an election for which you have to spend less than 40 lakh rupees in crores of rupees by spending crores of rupees so all this money which is spent on contesting elections which is above the limit that you can spend is black money and that is why the black money exists in our society so uh, you know uh, almost 99% of the money having been recovered in big currency shows that the black money was actually converted to white by all these people who were possessing black money they paid money to poor people to stand in queues for them or they got it exchanged through back doors in the banks because i am told that bank managers 
uh, you know, uh, thoroughly exploited the situation and they also made money. So, it is the nexus of the, the ruling elites and the rich, you know, which survived demonetization, whereas it, the poor was hit very hard. Some of the businesses have still not been able to, you know, recover from the uh, demonetization exercise. And the GST, of course, uh, you know, is, is now proved that was a bad idea because the government itself is now saying that it will bring down the higher levels of, you know, taxes to 15 or 18 percent. Uh, so, you know, what was the whole point of, uh, you know, calling the parliament in midnight, you know, and, and taking, making it appear as if this decision was as important as the independence of this country uh, when a midnight ceremony was held. Uh, so, this government does not have any idea of governance. It believes in show off. It, 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 uh, it uh, does things in a, in, in a uh, you know, grand standing manner. It boasts. It makes all kinds of claims which are usually false. And it, it uh, in the end, you know, they uh, essentially bungle up, they mismanage and uh, they uh, have lost a hold on the governance of this country, including the law and order situation. Um, so, our economy has been hit very hard by these two decisions, demonetization and GST. And uh, we only hope that, you know, uh, the next government will be more pre pro-people.